Okay, welcome back everyone. Cube's coverage here in Boston, Massachusetts. AWS Reinforced 22, the security conference. It's AWS's big security conference. Of course, the Cube's here. All the reInvent, Re's, Remars, Reinforce, we cover them all now, and the summits. I'm John Furrier, my host, Dave Vellante. We have IDC weighing in here with their analysis. We've got some great guests here. Jay Bresman, Research VP at IDC, and Philip Booz, Research Manager for Cloud Security. Gentlemen, thanks hey for guys. coming on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great oh, to be here. The Come full circle, right? <laughs> <laughs> this security is more interesting than storage, isn't it? <laughs> Dave, Dave and Jay work together. This is a, um, a great um, segment. I'm psyched that you guys are here. We had Crawford and Matt Eastwood on at HPE Discover a sure. while back, and yeah. really the, 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 the data you guys are getting and the insights are fantastic, so congratulations to IDC. You guys are doing great work. We yeah. appreciate your time. Um, I want to get your reaction to the event and the keynotes. AWS has got some posture and they're very aggressive on some tones, some things that they didn't, we didn't hear. What's your reaction to the keynote? Share your, your assessment. So, you know, I manage two different research services at IDC right now. Uh, they are both cloud security and identity and, uh, and, and digital security, right? Um, and what was really interesting is the intersection between the two this morning, because every one of those speakers that came on had something to say about identity or least privilege access, or, you know, enable MFA or, Make sure that you uh, you know control who gets access to what and deny explicitly, right? And it's always been a challenge a little bit in the identity world because uh, a lot of people don't use MFA. And in RSA, that was another big theme at the RSA conference, right? MFA everywhere. Why don't they use it? Because it introduces friction, and all of a sudden people can't get their jobs done, right? And the whole point of a network is letting people on to get at data they want to get to. So that was kind of interesting, uh, but um, you know, as we have in the industry, this uh, shared responsibility model for cloud computing, we've got shared responsibility for between <laughs> Philip and I. I have done in the past more security of the cloud, and Philip is more security in the cloud. So. Uh -huh. yeah. and, it's, and now with cloud operation, or super cloud as we call it, you have on-premises, private cloud coming back, or hasn't really gone anywhere, all that on-premises cloud operations public cloud and now edge exploding with new requirements. Yeah. It's really an ops challenge right now. Not yeah, so well, much dev. So right. the sec and ops side is hot right now. Yeah, well we've made this move from monolithic to microservices based applications. And so during the uh, keynote this morning, the announcement around the guard duty malware protection component and that being built into the pricing of current guard duty I thought was was really key. And there was also a lot of talk about partnering and security certifications. Uh, which is also so very important. So we're seeing this move towards uh, filling in that talent gap, which I think we're all aware of in the security industry. So Jay, square the circle for me. So uh, Kirk Kufel talked about Amazon, AWS identity. Where does AWS leave off and, and companies like Okta or Ping Identity or Cyberock pick up? How are they working together? Does it just create more confusion and more tools for customers? We, we have, we know the over word, <laughs> the overused word of seamless. Yeah, yeah. It's never seamless. So no. How should we think about that? So, you know, identity has been around for 35 years or something like that. Started with the mainframes and all that. And if you understand the history of it, you make more sense of the current market. You have to know where people came from and the baggage they're carrying, because they're still carrying a lot of that baggage. Now, when it comes to the cloud service providers, they're more an accommodation from the identity standpoint. Let's make it easy inside of AWS to let you single sign on to anything in the cloud that they have, right? Let's also introduce uh, an additional MFA capability to keep people safer whenever we can and you know, provide people the tools to, to get into those applications somewhat easily, right, while leveraging identities that may live somewhere else. So, you know, there's a whole lot of the world that is still Active Directory centric, right? There's another portion of companies that were born in the cloud that were able to jump on things like Okta and some of the other uh, providers of these universal identities in the cloud. Um, so, you know, like I said, you, if you understand where people came from in the beginning, uh, you start to, to say, yeah, this makes sense. Right? It's, under, it's under interesting, you talk about mainframe. I, I always think about Rack F, uh, you know, and I say, okay, who did what, when, where? Yeah. And you hear about a lot of those themes. What, so what's the best practice for MFA? 
uh, that's, that's non-SMS based? Is it, you got to wear something around your neck? Is it to have sort of a third party authenticator? What are people doing that, is, that, that, that you guys would recommend? Yeah, one quick comment about adoption of MFA. Um, you know, if you ask different suppliers what percent of your base that does SSO also does MFA, one of the biggest suppliers out there, Microsoft, will tell you it's under 25%. That's pretty shocking, right? All the messaging that's come out about it. So another big player in the market was called Duo, Cisco bought them, yep. right? And because they provide networks, a lot of people buy their MFA, they have probably the most prevalent type of MFA, it's called push, right? And push can be you know, a, a red X and a green check mark to your phone, it can be a QR code you know, somewhere, it can be an email push as well. Uh, so that is the next easiest thing to adopt after SMS. And as you know, SMS has been denigrated by NIST and others saying, you know, it's susceptible to man in the middle attacks. It's built on a telephony protocol called SS7. Yep. You know, predates anything. There's no certification either side. The other re real dynamic and identity is the whole adoption of PKI infrastructure. As you know, certificates are used for all kinds of things, network sessions, data encryption, well, identity increasingly. And a lot of the um, you know, consumers, and especially the work from anywhere people these days, have access through smart devices, right? And what you can do there is you can have an agent on that smart device generate your private key and then push out a public key, and so the private key never leaves your device. That's one of the most secure ways to So if your SIM something. card gets hacked, you're not going to be as, as vulnerable? Or yeah, as vulnerable. well, the SIM card is another you know, challenge yeah. associated <laughs> with you know, the, the older uh, ways, but yeah. yeah. So what do you guys think about the open source connection? And, and uh, they, they mentioned it up top, don't bolt on security, implying shift left, which is embedding it in like sneak, companies like Sneak do that very container oriented, a lot of Kubernetes kind of cloud native services. So I want to get your reaction to that. And then also this reasoning angle they brought up. Kind of a higher level AI of reasoning decisions. So open source and yeah. this notion of AI reasoning. Yeah, and, reasoning. And, they, and you see more open source discussion happening, right? So you, you, know, you have your building, maintaining, and the vetting of the upstream open source code, which is uh, critical, and so I think uh, AWS talking about that today, they're certainly hitting on a nerve as you know, open source continues to proliferate. Um, around the automated reasoning, uh, I think that makes sense. You, know, you want to provide um, guide rails and you want to provide roadmaps and um, you want to have sort of uh, that uh, guidance at, as to, okay, what's the, you know, a correlation analysis of different tools and products. And so, I think that's going to go over really well. Yeah. One of the other, you know, key points about open source is, everybody's in a multi-cloud world, right? Yeah. And so they're worried about vendor lock-in. They want an open source code base so that they don't experience that. Yeah, and they can move the code around and make sure it works well on each system. Right. Dave and I were just talking about uh, some of the dynamics around data control plane, so yeah. they mentioned encrypt everything, which is a great message, by the way, I love that one. But, oh, and he mentioned data at rest. I'm like, what about data in flight? I didn't hear that one. So one of the things we're seeing with super cloud and now multi-cloud kind of as destinations of that, is that in digital transformation, customers are leaning into owning their data flows. Yeah. Independent of, say, the control plane aspects of what could come in. This has huge implications for security. We're sharing data is huge. Even Schmidt on stage said, we have billions and billions of things happening that we see things that no one else sees. So that implies they're sharing quad that. Trillion. Quad right. trillion. Right. 15 right. zeros. <laughs> yeah, right. 15 zeros. 15 zeros, right. yeah. So that implies they're sharing that or using that, pushing that into something. So sharing is huge with cyber security. So that implies open data, <laughs> data flows. Yeah. What do you, how do you guys see this evolving? I know it's kind of emerging, but it's becoming a, a, a nuanced point that's critical to the architecture. Well, I, yeah, I think another way to look at that is the sharing of intelligence and some of the recent directives you know, from the executive branch, making it easier for private companies to share data and intelligence, which I think strengthens the cyber community overall. Depending upon the supplier, right? It's yeah. either an aggregate level of intelligence that has been, you know, anonymized, mm -hmm. or it's specific intelligence for your environment uh, that, you know, everybody's got a threat feed, maybe two or three, <laughs> right? Yeah. But back to the encryption point, you know, I was working for an encryption startup for a little while, right? After I left IBM, 
And uh, the thing is that people are scared of it. Right? They're scared of key management and rotation. And so when you provide... Because they might lose the key. Exactly. Yeah. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. Right? Um, so that's when you have things like uh, you know, KMS services from Amazon and stuff that really help out a lot and help people understand, okay, I'm not alone in this. Yeah, crypto owners. This, they call it a hybrid. Well. <laughs> the hybrid key, they call it what they call the key. They call it the hybrid, um, what was it? Key the management word? service, yeah. The hybrid Oh, key. hybrid HSM, correct? Yeah, what is that? What is that? I didn't, I didn't get that. I didn't understand what he so, meant by the hybrid post, hybrid post quantum key agreement. Right. That's the notes I Hybrid post-quantum key exchange. You know, AWS never made a product name that didn't have four words in it. <laughs> but, well, he did, well, but he did yeah. reference the, the new NIST algos, and I think I inferred that they were quantum proof, or the, the claiming to be, yeah. and AWS was testing those. Correct, yeah. So that was kind of interesting. But I want to come back to identity for a second. Okay. So, so this idea of bringing traditional IAM and, and privilege access management together. Is that a pipe dream? Is that something that is actually going to happen? What's the time frame? What's your take on that? So, you know, there are aspects of privilege in every sort of identity. Back when, you know, it was only the back office that used computers for calculations, right? Um, then you were able to control how many people had access. There were two types of users, admins and users, right? These days, Everybody has some aspect of it's privilege. a real spectrum. Yeah, They're really so you, granular. you've got yeah. the you know the C-suite, the finance people, the DevOps people, you know even partners and whatever. They all need some sort of privileged access, and the 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 term you hear so much is least privileged access, right? Shut it down, control it. Um, so, you know, in some of my research, I've been saying that vendors who are in the PAM space, privilege access management space, will probably be growing their suites playing a bigger role, building out a stack, because they have uh, you know, the, the expertise and the, and the perspective that says, we should control this better. How do we do that? Right? And we've been seeing that recently. Is that a combination of old, kind of antiquated systems meets proprietary <laughs> hyperscale or kind of like build your own? Because I mean, Amazon, these guys, they, Facebook, they all build their own stuff. But yes, then they do. Enterprises buy services from yeah. general purpose identity management systems. So as we were talking about, you know, knowing the, the past and whatever, privilege access management used to be about compliance reporting. Yeah. Right? Just making sure that I knew who accessed what and could prove it so I didn't fail an audit. It wasn't a critical infrastructure item. No, and now these days, what it's transitioning into is much more risk management, it, okay? It, I know what our risk is, I'm ahead of it. And the other thing in the PAM space was really um, session monitoring. Right, everybody wanted to watch every keystroke, every screen scrape, all that kind of stuff. A lot of the new privilege access mon management doesn't really require that. It's a nice to have feature. You kind of need it on the list, but is anybody really going to implement it? That's the question. Right, and then, you know, if, if you do all that session monitoring, does anybody ever go back and look at it? How, it's only so many hours in the day. How about passwordless? Access, <laughs> you know, right? I've heard people talk about that. And yeah. I mean, that's, as a user, I can't wait, but, <laughs> Well, know. it's somewhere we want to all go, yep. right? We all want identity security to just disappear and be recognized when we log in. So the, the thing with password lists is there's always a password somewhere. And it's usually part of a registration, you know, action. I'm going to register my device with a username password. And then beyond that, I can use my biometrics. Right? I want to register my device and get a private key that I can put in my enclave, and I'll use that in the future. Maybe it's got a touch ID, maybe it doesn't. Right? Uh, so even though there's been a lot of progress made, it's not quote unquote truly passwordless. Uh, there's a group, uh, industry standards group called FIDO, uh, right? which is Fast Identity Online. And what they realized was these whole registration passwords that's really a single point of failure, because if I can't recover my device, I'm in trouble. Yeah. So they just did a, uh, a new extension to sort of what they were doing, which provides you with much more of a, like an iCloud vault, right? That you can register that uh, device in and other devices associated with that same that identity. That you can get to it if you have to. Exactly. I, I another, I'm all over the place here, but I, I want to ask about <laughs> ransomware. It may not be your wheelhouse, yeah. but back in the day, Jay, remember you used to cover tape, all, yeah. the, all the backup guys now are talking about ransomware. AWS mentioned it today and they showed a bunch of best practices and things you can do. Air gaps wasn't one of them. 
right. I was really surprised, because that's all anybody ever talks about is air gaps, and a lot of times that air gaps, that air gap could be, I guess, to the cloud, I guess. I'm not sure, what are you guys seeing on ransomware well, and yeah, air gaps? And, you know, we've done a lot of great research around ransomware as a service and ransomware, and, and you know, we just had some data come out recently that I think in terms of spending, uh, and, and spend, and in, as a result of the Ukraine-Russia war, that ransomware assessments rate number one. And so it's something that we encourage, you know, and when we talk to vendors and uh, in our services, uh, in our publications that we write about, taking advantage of those free strategic ransomware assessments, vulnerability assessments, right, as well, and then uh, security and training rank very highly as well. So we want to make sure that um, all of these areas are being funded well to try and stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, I was surprised to not see air gaps on the list. That's all anybody talks about. Well, you yeah. know the, the old model for air gapping in the, uh, the land days, the Novell days, you took your tapes home and put them in the sock drawer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a form of air gap. <laughs> and then the internet came around and ruined it. <laughs> guys, final question I want to ask you as we kind of yeah. zoom out. Great, great commentary, by the way, appreciate it. As uh, um, we've seen this in many markets, a collection of tools emerge, and then there's a, it's tool sprawl. Oh yeah. Right? yeah. So cyber, we're seeing the trend now where Mongo's up on stage of all the ecosystem partners, probably other vendors doing the same thing, where they're organizing a platform on top of AWS to be this super platform, if you super cloud capability, by building more platform things. So we're saying there's a platform war going on, because customers don't want the complexity. Yeah. I got a tool, but it's actually making it more complex if I buy the other tool. So the tool sprawl becomes a problem. How do you guys see this? Do you guys see this uh, platform emerging? I mean, tools won't go away, but they have to be easier. Yeah, we do see a, a consolidation of functionality and services, uh, and we've been seeing that, I think, through a 2020 cloud security survey that we released that, that was definitely a trend. And, uh, you know, that certainly happened for many companies over the last six to 24 months, I would say. Um, and then uh, platformization absolutely is something we talk and write about all the time, so. Uh, yeah. More you know, a Couple of years yeah. ago, uh, <laughs> I called the, uh, the Amazon tool set an erector set, yeah. because it really required assembly. Yeah. And you see the emphasis on training here too, right? Yeah. You definitely need to go to AWS University to be competent. Yeah. It wasn't Lego blocks yet. No. Nope. <laughs> it was a rector set. Yeah. Very good distinction. Screws, you know? <laughs> and, and you lose a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But still, still too many tools, right? Yep. You see, we need more consolidation. It's interesting because a lot of yeah. these companies have runway. And you look, you look at SailPoint, its stock price has held up because of the Toma Bravo acquisition, but all the rest of the cyber stocks have been crushed. Yeah. You know, especially the high flyers like a Sentinel One or a CrowdStrike, but yeah. just yeah. still M&A opportunities. So platform there. wars. Yeah. Okay, final thoughts. What do you think is happening next? What's, what's your outlook for the, for the next year or so? Um, so in the, in the identity space, I'll talk about, Philip can cover cloud for us. Um, you know, it really is more consolidation and more adoption of things that are beyond simple SSO, right? Um, it was you know, just getting on the systems and now we really need to control uh, what you're able to get to and who you are. And do it as transparently as we possibly can because otherwise you know, people are going to lose productivity, right? They're not going to be able to get to what they want and that's what uh, causes the C-suite to say, wait a minute, you know, DevOps, they want to update the product every day, right? make it better. Can they do that, or did security get in the way? People every once in a while call security the department of no, right? Yeah, well. Yeah, they fit it on stage. They yeah. want to be the department of yes. Exactly, yeah. and the department that creates additional value. Yeah. If you look at what's going on with B2C or SIAM, a consumer-oriented identity, that is all about opening up new direct channels and treating people like, you know, they're old friends, yeah. right? Not like you don't know them, you have to challenge them. We always say, you want to be in the boat together. It sinks or not, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Philip on Okay, what's your take? What's your outlook for the year? Yeah, I think, you know, something that we've been seeing is consolidation and integration. And so, you, you know, companies looking at from build time to run time, investing in shift left infrastructure as code, and then also in the runtime detection, 
makes perfect sense to have both the agent and agentless uh, so that you're covering any of the gaps that might exist. Awesome. Very Jay, nice. Philip, thanks for coming on theCUBE with IDC and sharing your oh, our pleasure. perspectives, yeah, commentary, so much and insights <laughs> and outlook. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. Okay, we've got the great direction here from IDC analyst here on theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be back more after this short break.